Hebrews 4 is where we're opening our Bibles. Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. And pay attention, because this is God's word, Hebrews 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we know full well that we can't understand your word, much less have it sink into our hearts and change us unless you do the work for us. So we ask that you would come in and preach Christ to our fainting hearts, to our hard hearts. Soften what needs to be softened. Challenge what needs to be challenged. Relieve burdens where burdens need to be relieved. And cut away everything that blocks our view of Jesus this morning. In your name we pray, amen. I'm gonna say something, and then I'm gonna take a tangent, and then I'm gonna come back around to it. What I'm gonna say is, Every single one of us has a priest need. Every single one of us has a priest need. In other words, every last one of us is hardwired to need a priest. That may sound weird to some of you, and I'll get there, but first I wanna talk about something different for a second and come back around. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of over all the hype about the movie Frozen. Seriously, I'm kind of tired of it. I'm tired of seeing it on Facebook everywhere. I'm tired of my kids showing me the DVD because they want to see it one more time. I'm just sort of over the movie. In fact, for a long time, because it was so hyped, I didn't watch it. I kept myself from seeing it. You know, I wanted to feel above the fray and feel like I was better than culture. So that's what I did while my kids watched it a bunch of times. I mean, and what is up? Let it go. Seriously, it's not that great of a song. And I know for some of you that's like the most heretical thing I just said, but it's really not that great of a song. I mean, here's how I conceptualize the the creative team that was thinking through that song. They were sitting around a table and they were just sort of cutting up a little bit and one guy suddenly says to him, hey man, I'll bet you $100 that you can't write a hit song with the words frozen fractals in them. And the other guy was like, game on. So he writes this song, hit song, top of the billboard charts. What's up with the phrase frozen fractals? Frozen fractals all around. Like, why? I mean, what's, that's just odd. Fractals is like a scientific term or an artistic term, but it's definitely not a, not a, you know, something you put in a song that's going to be a hit in the movies and on Broadway and those kinds of things. So I'm kind of biased against Frozen, and it took me a long time, but my kids eventually sat me down to watch it. And by the way, going back to Let It Go, I'm sort of tired of seeing all your kids saying it on Facebook. I could do without it a little bit, you know. Just every kid has to have a video of them singing Let It Go on Facebook, and that's been going on a while. I'm glad that that's almost over with. But anyway, I sat down, and I was going to watch this movie for the first time, kind of skeptical, just sort of sitting there being with my kids because they loved it so much. We watched the movie. We start into it. It's great animation, good music. It's just really cool. And then somewhere in the middle of the movie, all of a sudden, my four-year-old daughter, Bronwyn, disappears. I don't know where she's gone, and I'm like, hey, I'm watching this for you. Where are you going? I want to disappear. And so uh, we continue watching the movie, then all of a sudden, right before Let It Go comes on, Bronwyn reappears in a princess outfit, and she begins to start singing Let It Go from top to bottom at the top of it. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? But you're not for anymore. Yeah. You know, she does all that, and she knows all the motions, she has all the passion, and my heart's only kind of melting at my daughter at this point. We skip to the end of the movie, and it's that climactic scene, and throughout the movie they've been saying this mantra that uh, only love can melt a frozen heart, only love can thaw, only an act of true love can thaw a frozen heart. So at the end of this movie, the two sisters uh, are in deep trouble, and the sister who hasn't been nice 
is, is almost at the point of getting ready to be killed by um, this other evil dude. Hans, thank you. Who said that? Thank you. Yep, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I can see how important it is to our congregation. Maybe we'll get back to the Bible soon. Um, but so she, Hans is raising his sword, and then in jumps Elsa. And instead of choosing what she thinks is going to save her, which is a kiss from, who is it? Kristoff, thank you, thank you. See, I, I, I try to block it out, actually. So as all this is going on, uh, Elsa jumps in the middle. She raises her hand, and in her, final, uh, in her final breath, because she's got this disease that makes her, her heart and her whole body totally frozen now, uh, she freezes up, the sword breaks, and all of a sudden, uh, Anna, or Elsa, realizes what Anna has done for her, and it melts her heart, and she begins to weep over her sister. I'll just say that maybe a ball of sweat was dripping from my eye at that moment. Maybe two, maybe four. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the middle of the movie, weeping my eyes out over this uh, tremendous act, right? Why do we cry in moments like that? I would tell you that we cry in moments like that because in that moment, we saw a priest in action. And every person on this planet has a priest need. And when we see a priestly action, our heart starts resonating with it. So let's define priest broadly. I want to give you kind of a broad definition of a priest so that we aren't too scared about this phrase. A priest is someone who stands between the broken relationship of two parties. A priest is someone who stands between the broken relationship of two parties. Every single person on this planet has a priest need. We're all hardwired. It's in our bones as human beings to need a priest. The fact that we all need priests is exposed in 10,000 places in our lives. And I'd like to show you a bunch of those places. For instance, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about whether you're a Christian or believe in some other world religion, why it is that every religion in humanity manufactures a priest figure, or nearly every religion? I mean, think about it. The guru, the imam, the shaman, the medium, the monk. You'd think, with all the creativity of humanity, if we were really just a blank slate, and there were no God out there, that the religions of the world would be a little bit more creative, a little bit more diverse, right? But it's like no matter what religion we invent as human beings, we can't escape our hardwired need for a priest. And you might say this, you might say, I'm not a religious person, I don't believe that stuff. I have no need to kind of invent a priest. But there are all kinds of irreligious ways that our, our priest need comes out we might pick out a few of those. What would be those irreligious ways? Uh, who would be those irreligious persons? I can think of one of the most irreligious people I know, Eminem. How about that? He's been in the news over the years for his off-color ly lyrics, his misogyny, and his uh, degradation and outspoken disdain of homosexuals. He's just been a controversial figure because he's pushing every button. He doesn't strike me as a religious guy. And yet on uh, his most recent album out in November, the beginning track is this interesting, fascinating, and artistic dialogue between his conscience and himself about all the things that he's done up till this point. And so I'm going to read to you a portion with no expletives, because this part doesn't have any, actually, uh, of, of Eminem's conscience and what his conscience is accusing Eminem of. He says, I also represent anyone on the receiving end of those jokes you offend. I'm the nightmare you fell asleep and then woke up still in. I'm your karma closing in with each stroke of a pen. Perfect time to have some remorse to show for your sin. In my head, there's a voice in the back and it hollers after the track is demolished. I'm your lack of a conscience. I'm the ringing in your ears. I'm the polyps on the back of your tonsils eating your vocal cords after your concerts. I'm your time that's almost up that you haven't acknowledged. Grab some water, but I'm that pill that's too jagged to swallow. I'm the future that's here to show you what happens tomorrow. He's accusing him. And this is all coming from the mind and the heart of a conflicted artist. 
And it's as though you hear him say, I need someone to stand between me and myself. I'm a total contradiction, and I feel the tension of the exposure to the watching world, right? Eminem actually exposes more deeply what our priest need is about. Because a priest is, isn't just someone who stands between the broken relationship of two parties. A priest is someone who mediates that broken relationship by defending the validity of one to another. Again, a priest stands between two parties who have a broken relationship, but mediates that relationship by defending the validity of one to another. Eminem saying, I don't feel valid. I feel like a contradiction. And I need someone, something to validate me. We all have a priest need. Or think about very non-religious professions, callings, vocations, dedicated to very priestly duties. These jobs we create in society satisfy our priest need. I mean, think of lawyers. What lawyers do is often mediate between the state and an individual, or mediate between two parties who are disagreeing, oftentimes so that they can prove or she can prove the validity of one person to another. Or think about therapists. Therapists sit in an office to help someone be mediated with someone else or to a world because of their own brokenness. Therapists have have a kind of priestly duty about them. Or think about plastic surgeons. Their job, if I can kind of put it in a funny way, to put it in priestly language, is to cleanse your appearance so that they might present you faultless before a watching world, right? They might move away a few wrinkles, lift a few parts of your body because they want to show you as blameless, as beautiful, as perfect and flawless before a watching world. We have a priest need, folks. It's everywhere. It's exposed in all these places. I mean, think about tell-all books. We've got recent tell-all books out by Barbara Walters and Monica Lewinsky. You know, it's not only for money that they do those things. In fact, it's not really about the money. And it's not just to set the record straight either. It's so that the painful burden of their secrets can be confessed and relieved. In this way, the watching world, their readership, becomes their priest that they go to confession to. Because you can't imagine probably what it's like for them to just finally come out about all the dark places. And they need priests too. This is a more funny example that my wife uh, told me about that's very common among ladies when they're like going out for a girl's night and they're out to dinner. Imagine you're with your, your group of girlfriends and you're all finishing up dinner. Gab, 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 gab. Two hours later, gab, 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 gab. Stop talking a lot, you know. And then it comes around, uh, the, the waitress or waiter comes and plops the dessert menu on the table, right? What happens in that moment? It first starts with a little murmuring, right? Comments like, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty full. And dessert's just kind of empty calories, you know, yeah. And someone's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty full too, you know. I, I don't really want it. And someone else says, well, you know, if, if one of you got a dessert, I might, you know, like have a bite or something. <laughs> and I know I'm totally talking like a valley girl, but it's my only impression of like a girl that I have. So um, I, I might have a bite or something like that, if you would. And the girl's like, you know, I might do that. I mean, maybe we could, you know, split it. Oh, yeah, you know. But, but you know what? That, that's just empty calories. I don't know if I want to do that. I mean, I've had my dinner. I think, you know, I'm pretty, feeling pretty full. Then all of a sudden, this is what changes the whole table dynamic for ladies. The one lady says, I think I'll order dessert. Then all of a sudden, all the others say, oh, yeah, I think so, too. In fact, I think I'm going to order my own dessert. Oh, yeah, what are we going to get? You're going to get the tiramisu, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, they're all ordering their own desserts because the dessert priest stood in the gap (laughs) and presented that before them, right? Ladies, you have dessert priests. One more example. Several weeks ago after church, my family and I were uh, at McDonald's. And in the spirit of comedian Jim Gaffigan, I know what you're already thinking. You're thinking, oh my goodness, he's at McDonald's? It's gotta be so bad for him. It's so unhealthy. Those things aren't organic. You cannot eat that stuff. And as Jim Gaffigan would say, they serve 86 million people a year. Some one of you has to be lying about it, right? Right? So anyway, judgmental people, I was pulling out of McDonald's with my family after church, okay? 
We're pulling out of McDonald's, driving. Two minutes later, I get on my phone. Dwayne Miller, a pastor here, is calling me. I'm like, what's going on? Maybe he's calling to, you know, uh, he, he calls. I answer the phone. He says, Zach, you don't know how much you blessed me today. And I'm thinking, uh, worship service, like, you know, great set of music. He was really touched by something I did, and he's just going to rub warm fuzzies all over me or something like that. And he says, I just saw you pull out of McDonald's. <laughs> and it made me feel validated. He said, I see skinny, beautiful people driving out of McDonald's. It makes me feel like it's okay. And all of a sudden, I became Dwayne's food priest in that moment. I became Dwayne's food priest. And so you see, we all need a priest. Why in the world does our priest need run so deeply? We can get the answer to this by unpacking what the Bible has to say or show about the role of a priest. And Hebrews, a little later in Hebrews, actually has a nice summary. Don't turn there, but, but listen. It first tells us about kind of the architecture of the temple to give it a, a, a big gravitas, to give it a big uh, weight to it. And then it tells us about the role of the priest. Listen to what this says about what a priest is and does. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstands and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. These preparations having been made, the priests go regularly into the first section. And don't, you've got to get out of your head that it's some sort of beautiful thing. It's actually quite gross because they've been outside the tents cutting up animals bleeding them out, gathering their blood, gathering their meat to bring in these sacrifices before God, right? So these preparations having been thus made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, and he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. Listen up. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. And right there you have it. If we had to sort of describe what a priest's job is, it's to perfect the conscience of the person they're representing in a sense, to ease their conscience, you know, to, to satisfy their conscience. Why ultimately do people commit suicide? Ultimately, it's because our conscience can't be satisfied. Why do young people resort to cutting themselves? Because our conscience can't be satisfied. Why do our marriages fall apart? because the intimacy of marriage exposes us for the frauds that we are. And suddenly our conscience starts getting the better of us because someone sees who we actually are and we can't hide. And living with them day after day after day becomes a heavy burden, something that, that cannot be satisfied in you. Why do years of therapy under counselors that tell us, you just need to think better of yourself, have a better self-esteem, why does that counseling never work? Because deep down in my conscience, I know that I can't think better of myself because I'm not better. Or think about this question. Why do so many non-Christians rightfully, rightfully leave the church and say that we're all a bunch of hypocrites? Because deep down they know that neither they nor anyone else can look at themselves and have a satisfied conscience, and yet so many of us walk around as though we're completely satisfied in our conscience about how good and how righteous we are. You know, if you're here today and you don't follow Jesus, but somehow you ended up in this room, I want to say to you one thing. You're right. You're totally right. We are hypocrites. Our consciences aren't the least bit satisfied about ourselves when we're looking in. We need a priest. People, if you have ears to hear, 
hear this. Jesus is the great high priest who knows our pain and sits on a throne of grace. I'm gonna say it again, because God's saying this to us today. Jesus is our great high priest who knows our pain and sits on a throne of grace. Let's unpack this. Jesus is the great high priest. You know, sometimes we Christians so focus on the ministry of what Jesus did that we forget what Jesus does as our active high priest. Christian, be assured of this. Every time you sin, even the times you don't know you're messing up, Jesus is in that moment pleading before the Father, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. In that moment, Jesus is doing that. You know, when Jesus left and ascended and left the disciples, the Bible says he took his place in heaven and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. Why did he do that? He didn't do that so he could be like, what up earth? Look who's king now, Jesus is in the hizzy. He didn't do that, that wasn't the point. When he ascended, he did that so he could plead for you. So he could be at the the ear of God the Father and have your back. That's why he went there, that's why he ascended. Jesus is an active high priest. Listen to what Romans eight says. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who is interceding for us. And that word in the original language is in the present tense. And in that language, when the word interceding is in the present tense, it just doesn't mean that it's happening now, but it's happening ongoingly, again and again and again. That's Jesus' job, is to intercede for you and for me toward God the Father. Have we truly grasped this? You know, I have four kids, and just in, it's just the case that uh, when, you, when you have as many kids as I do, because, you know, a parent like you can't see everything, your home becomes a den of lies, deception, and trickery, and frequently I find myself busting a kid for something that they didn't do. I often find that, and I kind of jump to conclusions, and oftentimes when I get started laying into a kid, I don't give him an ounce. I start reading in the riot act. I'm in their face and uh, just totally busting them. And I see them shrink more and more as I, as I jump on them. But because there are so many brothers and sisters, usually there are lots of witnesses. And if they're kind to one another, sometimes it's the case that when I'm busting a kid and uh, they don't deserve it, one of their brothers and sisters comes to their aid and says, They didn't do that, it was an accident, or one of their other brothers or sisters did it, or something like that. But in that moment, when they're being defended by someone else, and I have to pause, I look at the one I'm accusing, and it's like you see their whole countenance change. It's like you see uh, the, the relief come over them, the burden lift from their back and their face light up when they realize that suddenly they're being vindicated, suddenly they're being proven to be innocent, right? Have you ever been there or in another circumstance? Do you remember feeling what it's like when against all odds, someone stands up for you? Someone sticks up for you? Someone is in your corner? Do you feel alone? Do you feel like no one really has your back? Do you feel exposed and friendless? I tell you this, You have someone in your corner who has the attention and the ear of the only one whose opinion of you matters. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he's a friend of sinners. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is in your corner. Jesus is pleading for you. Jesus is for you. Jesus has your back. We have a great high priest whose name is love. That's why verse 14 says, amen. That's why verse 14 says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let's hold fast to our confession. But I know some of us here are still skeptical. He doesn't really know me. He doesn't understand. He can't identify with me. He's God. I'm human, but I say to you, don't forget 
that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Jesus isn't like some rich, high-powered lawyer downtown in a classy suit defending your case from his office chair who only visits you in the projects when he has to do research for his case. No, Jesus lives with us where we're at. Jesus is a high priest who knows our pain. That's why verse 15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now when we hear something like that, and you hear a preacher say, so he identifies with you, see? He's tempted like you were, and and yet he didn't sin, but he knows your pain. Two objections come into our hearts. The first is, Jesus was God. He doesn't know what my temptation feels like. He never gave in to my temptation. It was easy, he never gave in to temptation. It was easy for him. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity answers this, I think, definitively when he says, no man knows how bad he is till he tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Those, only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. And you find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows the full to the full, what temptation really means. He's the only complete realist. That's mind-blowing to realize that Jesus knows full well what our temptation's like and actually knows better than us because he never gave in. He was the righteous one who fought till the end until it gave up. And that, we, we can't just say it was because he was God. We have to acknowledge Jesus was fully human. And he knew what it was like to feel the sin asking him to join in the fun. He knew what it it felt like for the sin to ask him to join in the corruption and the brokenness. But there's another objection that arises to Jesus truly understanding our pain. Jesus doesn't know what it's like to sin. How could he really understand me? How could he empathize with me and my struggles? No, Jesus never sinned, but he knows exactly, exactly what each and every one of your sins feels like. 1 Peter 2.24, listen to this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Notice that this isn't just that Jesus bore the punishment for our sins, though he did. No, on the cross, he bore our sins. He felt our sins. He felt our conflicted conscience and our guilty shame. No, Jesus wasn't a sinner, but he knows even more deeply than you what being a sinner feels like. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Praise the living God that we have a great high priest, an advocate who knows us and who knows our pain. But here, my friends, is the real zinger. Jesus is not only a high priest, and Jesus doesn't only just know our pain. Jesus sits on a throne of grace. Think about this and prepare to have your souls be melted. Remember a priest's job? You know, a priest's job was to cut up an animal and burn it or present it to God the Father because something needed to be done to atone for the brokenness of sin. That means there needed to be some kind of substitute 
Because God is holy and because our sins rub against God the wrong way, because he's, he's completely good. And so the priest's job was to day after day, on behalf of other people, cut up animals and present them to God. But the scriptures reveal to us that Jesus, the great high priest, becomes the sacrifice. You see, up until that time, the people of God always saw the priest sacrifice an animal, something else for their sins. But for the first time, and might I add, for the last time, the priest becomes the sacrifice. Listen to what Hebrews 9 and 10 say. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Done. Paid in full. I will remember your sins no more, God says. Friends, Jesus is our high priest who knows our pain and who sits on a throne of grace. You see, it's not just that we need someone to plead our case, because if we're honest, we don't have one, right? And it's not just that we need someone to know our pain. We don't need just an advocate. We need a substitute. And his name is Jesus for you and for me. And he has the ear of the Father where he sits, pleading his life and his death on our behalf. Friends, look on him and live. And as you look on him, he looks back to you and he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. People of God, come. Come to your priest and sacrifice and rest.